Our next lecture is going to focus on tuberculosis. As you know, tuberculosis is a disease caused by a microorganism called Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Most commonly, the initial infection with Mycobacterium tuberculosis usually leads to what we call latent tuberculosis. Most symptomatic cases of tuberculosis are actually due to reactivation of the latent form rather than a primary exposure. Pulmonary tuberculosis is the most common manifestation, but really TB can affect any organ system. Almost all patients with tuberculosis have one or more established risk factors. These include recent immigration from outside of the United States within the past five years. That's because after five years, the risk of reactivating tuberculosis is extremely low. Prisoners, HIV positive patients, healthcare workers, anybody who has close contact with a TB patient, steroid users, patients with hematologic malignancy, alcoholics, or patients with diabetes mellitus. The clinical presentation usually includes previously listed risk factors presenting with a fever, cough, sputum, weight loss, hemoptysis, and night sweats. These symptoms are almost always present for greater than or equal to three weeks in duration. Remember, on step two, you cannot answer TB as the diagnosis without a clear risk factor. You must also have a cavity on chest x-ray or a positive smear for mycobacterium. The best initial test for tuberculosis will be a chest x-ray, as is the case with all respiratory infections. The sputum stain and culture must be specific for acid-fast bacteria, something which mycobacteria qualifies as, and this must be done three separate times and must be negative three separate times to fully exclude TB. If you do this, but your clinical suspicion is still high, you must pursue further diagnostics with either a bronchoscopy with BAL or through a pleural biopsy. Remember, a PPD skin test is never the best test for tuberculosis in a symptomatic patient. PPD is a screening test. The most common finding on imaging is going to be a cavity in the upper lobes. Here's a good example. Here you see upper lobe tuberculosis and some scarring that's pulling the minor fissure upwards. The scarring is from the initial infection which initially healed. The cavity is from reactivation that's probably causing the patient's current symptoms. Regarding the management of tuberculosis, once you have a positive smear, you should begin therapy with a four drug regimen. This includes rifampin, isoniazid, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol, which you can memorize through the acronym RIPE. Ethambutol, however, is not needed if it's known from the start of therapy that the organism is sensitive to all tuberculous medications. That's because ethambutol is given as part of this four-drug regimen prior to knowing the sensitivity of the organism. It helps with bugs that are actually resistant to certain types of anti-TB therapy. After you use RIPE for two months, you can stop the ethambutol and the pyrazinamide. At that point, you continue rifampin and isoniazid for the next four months. The standard of care is to treat tuberculosis for six months of total therapy. Treatment is extended to nine months in the following situations. Osteomyelitis, miliary tuberculosis, which is widespread disease at the time of presentation, meningitis, or if there's pregnancy or any other time that pyrazinamide therapy is contraindicated. For step two, you should also be familiar with the toxicities of anti-TB therapy. All TB medications, including the four we've mentioned, cause hepatotoxicity. You should not stop them, however, unless the transaminases rise to three to five times the upper limit of normal. A slight bump does not necessitate cessation of anti-TB therapy.
Individual adverse effects include the following. For rifampin, toxicities are a red color to body secretions, and the treatment is going to be none because that's simply a benign finding. For isoniazid, you can sometimes see peripheral neuropathy. The way to treat this is to use pyridoxine to prevent this from happening in the first place. Pyrazinamide has some toxicity, which is mostly hyperuricemia. Therefore, you don't have to treat these patients unless they become symptomatic with gout. In that case, you treat them the same as a gout flare. With regard to ethambutol, optic neuritis and changes in color vision is the main side effect. For this, you simply decrease the dose if the patient is in renal failure. Regarding the use of steroids in TB, glucocorticoids decrease the risk of constrictive pericarditis in those who have pericardial involvement of the TB. This can also decrease neurologic complications in TB meningitis. Remember, in TB treatment, pregnant patients should not receive pyrazanamide. One commonly tested point on step two is the correct use of the PPD. Indications for using a PPD test include the following. It is not a general screening test for the entire population. It's only used in risk groups previously described who need to be screened. The PPD test is not useful in those who are symptomatic or in those with abnormal chest x-rays. Again, it's a screening test, not a diagnostic test. So, what is considered a positive test? In duration is counted as positive. Erythema alone is irrelevant. You must have raised, indurated skin. In duration greater than 5 millimeters is considered positive in HIV positive patients, glucocorticoid users close contact with active TB patients, abnormal calcifications on the chest x-ray, organ transplant recipients. In duration greater than 10 millimeters is necessary to call it positive if it's a recent immigrant within the past five years, a prisoner, healthcare worker, close contact with a TB patient, or patients with hematologic malignancy, alcoholism, or diabetes. In other patients, in particular healthy patients without risk factors, in duration greater than 15 millimeters is necessary to call a positive PPD. Remember, everyone with a reactive PPD test should have a chest x-ray as the next step to exclude active disease. The PPD itself is actually a two-stage test. If the patient has never had a PPD before, a second test is indicated within one to two weeks if the first test is negative. This is because the first test may be falsely negative. If the second test is negative, you can be certain this is a true negative. If the second test is positive, that means your first test was actually a false negative. If the first test is positive, a second test is not necessary. If the PPD is confirmed as positive, then the first step is going to be to exclude active TB. This is done with a chest x-ray. If the chest x-ray is normal and active TB has been excluded, patients should receive nine months of isoniazid monotherapy. The positive PPD confers a 10% lifetime risk of TB. Isoniazid therapy will then result in a 90% reduction in risk. Therefore, your lifetime risk of reactivation goes from about 10% down to 1%. Those at really high risk, such as healthcare workers, should have a PPD annually in order to screen for conversion to a positive PPD and therefore for TB exposure. The majority of risk for developing active TB actually lies within those first two years after conversion. Once the PPD is positive, it will always be positive in the future. On step two, one particularly important tip is that the PPD test is one of the hardest and most misunderstood tests on this exam. You have to reread the preceding section and forget what you've learned in the past. What is given to you in this lecture is the way to approach PPD questions on step two. Lastly, Please remember that the previous BCG vaccination
has no effect on these recommendations. If the PPD is positive, the patient must take isoniazid for nine months, regardless of whether they've had a BCG vaccination. This concludes our lecture on tuberculosis.